Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about uh, the event known as Bleeding Kansas and also discussing the uh, effects of this um, event. And this is probably one of the most important events for understanding why the Civil War begins. Here are your goals. There are a lot of them, um, but I think you got it. Okay, so let's get started with background. So by 1854, the Republicans had emerged as a strong northern anti-slavery party. And this worried people, both people in the North and the South, um, because um, if the Republican Party ever won the presidency, uh, this the South threatened to break away. And that would be the start of the Civil War. So if a Republican guy wins the presidency, there will be war. Uh, but things hold together for a little while longer because the Democratic Party remains strong. And they're strong not just in the South, but they can also win votes in the North. And they win enough votes in the North to hang on to the presidency. So the next time there's a presidential election in 1856, James Buchanan wins the election for the Democrats and keeps the North and the South together for at least four more years. There's James Buchanan there. Um, so after 1856, though, some events begin to happen that weaken the Democrats and strengthen the Republicans. So one is bleeding Kansas, which we're going to talk about next, and also the caning of Charles Sumner, which kind of comes out of bleeding Kansas. Let's talk about Kansas. So as we talked about a few days ago, the Kansas-Nebraska Act um, divided the uh, remaining territory of the Louisiana Purchase up into two territories. And the people in these territories were going to vote on whether they would become free states or slave states. Uh, the bill that made the Kansas-Nebraska Act assumed that Nebraska would go free because it was up north, and they assumed that Kansas would be voted a slave state because it bordered other slave states like Missouri. Um, but this turned out not to be the case. By 1855, there were way, way more Northerners in Kansas than Southerners. And these Northerners were going to vote to make Kansas a free state. This is a big deal. Uh, when it looks like Kansas is going to turn into a free state, the Southerners freak out, like they lose their mind, and they feel cheated. Because it looks like what the North did with the Kansas-Nebraska Act is really just give themselves two free states, and that the South is not going to get any free state or any slave states out of the deal. Um, it also seems like the abolitionists in the North might have been plotting this the whole time because northern abolitionists have been paying northerners to move to Kansas in order to help it become a free state. So what happens is on election day, when the people of Kansas are going to vote whether they're going to be free or slave, um, a bunch of southerners from Missouri uh, go over into Kansas, like thousands and thousands of these Southerners known as border ruffians, invade Kansas and vote as many times as possible, sometimes at gunpoint, in order to make Kansas a slave state. And um, when the results of this vote are counted, it's uh, the slave votes vastly outnumber the free votes. So the border ruffians from the South won, and it looks like they were able to kind of cheat the election and turn Kansas into a slave state after all. But of course, the northern majority in Kansas, the people who want Kansas to become a free state, are unhappy with this um, this situation. And so the northerners who live in Kansas reject the false pro-slave government that got set up after this first election, and they set up their own um, government in Topeka, Kansas, insisting that Kansas is a non-slave state. Uh, when this happens, a gang of more than 1,000 southerners march in and burn down parts of another anti-slavery town called Lawrence. So it looks like there's going to be a little mini civil war between Northerners and Southerners in Kansas. And this actually turns out to be the case, especially when this guy, John Brown, pictured here, who is an anti-slavery fanatic, begins kidnapping and executing 
uh, pro-slave people with a broadsword, literally hacking them to pieces. So this guy, John Brown, kicks off a cycle of violence between pro-slave and anti-slavery people in Kansas. And this violence continues well into the Civil War. So Kansas, by 1856, has already fallen in to violence between the North and the South. So what does this mean for the rest of the country? Well, it turns out that the major outcome of bleeding Kansas, which is what this violence is known as, is the breakdown of the Democratic Party. So while the fighting is going on, President Buchanan, who remember was a Democrat, uh, they, he wanted to accept the pro-slavery constitution that was sent to him after that first election. So after all those pro-slavery people from Missouri cheated the system, um, Buchanan still wanted to accept their kind of false constitution and make Kansas a slave state. But Stephen A. Douglas, who you remember was the whole guy, the guy who came up with the Kansas-Nebraska Act in the first place, who was also a popular Northern Democrat, opposed Buchanan's move. And he pointed out that the, um, that the Kansas legislature was not fairly elected and that it would be wrong to accept this constitution that had come from a false election. And so this led to an argument between Northern Democrats who backed Stephen A. Douglas and Southern Democrats who supported Buchanan. And this argument led to a breakdown of the Democratic Party and it would weaken them in the next election. This is important because when they become weak in this election, the Republicans will be stronger and they will be able to win the presidency, which is what will start the Civil War. Another result of bleeding Kansas is uh, the growing divide between the North and the South. And this, um, and this happens because they have different views on what's happening in Kansas. To the Northerners, it looks like what's going on is the South is trying to cheat the system set up by the Kansas-Nebraska Act to steal a uh, state that they don't deserve. But to Southerners, it looks like the North is trying to steal land that was given to the South by the Kansas-Nebraska Act. So both sides see the other one as kind of cheating the system. And this turns into violence in the, in the Capitol building when um, a senator, Charles Sumner, is beat by a Southern congressman. Um, so Charles Sumner was giving a speech against uh, what was going on in Kansas, and he insulted a number of Southern senators in his speech. In revenge, a Southern senator, uh, Preston Brooks from South Carolina, later approached Sumner, who was sitting at his desk, and beat Sumner on the head over and over again with a gold-tipped cane until it broke. And this was to get revenge for the insults that Sumner had given to some of Preston's, Preston Brooks' family members. The South applauded Brooks and even re-elected him to Congress after he was kicked out the first time. But Northerners viewed Brooks' action as a sign of Southern barbarism, and many people shifted their votes to the Republican Party. All right, so what's the takeaway message here from Bleeding Kansas and the caning of Charles Sumner? Here they are. One, Bleeding Kansas we widened the divide between the North and the South. Each side believed the other side was trying to cheat uh, and gain power by cheating the other side. It, Bleeding Kansas also weakened the Democratic Party. Uh, the Northern Democrats split off and support Stephen A. Douglas, which weakens the Democratic Party and makes it unlikely that they'll be able to win the presidency. Three, um, it's, it strengthened the Republican Party. So the violence of the South in Kansas or, and in Congress leads a lot of people in the North to oppose slavery and to support the Republican Party. And what this means is that there was, the stage was set for a Republican victory in 1860. And with that, we will see the beginning of the Civil War. So Bleeding Kansas is kind of like the step before the Civil War. It leads right up to it. Thanks for listening. I'll see you guys tomorrow.